Uh, four weeks ago today, our eldest son, Justin, passed away. And once again, thank you for the tremendous outpouring of support. Thank you. On that morning, December the 27th, Pastor Elena texted herself a message. She does that. You know, some people talk to themselves. She, she texts herself. Uh, when Pastor Elena has a thought uh, that she wants to remember or recall at a later date, she texts it to herself. Now, not to worry, she never replies to her own texts, but um, she, she often texts herself profound phrases or ideas. She actually has me doing it now, and uh, it works. Four weeks ago today, on a uh, fateful morning for our family, she texted herself these words. Just because you don't know the answer doesn't mean you don't have the answer. This morning's message is titled, You Have What You Don't Know. I want you to open your Bible with me to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. Isaiah 7 and, 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 and 9, uh, the promised one is foreshadowed. And then in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, the Messiah, is announced. The one who would be bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace, would be placed upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. After Isaiah 53, the entire tone of the whole book changes. Isaiah 53, everything has been provided. Isaiah 54, the table has been set. And in Isaiah 55, we are invited to sit at the table and feast. Isaiah 55 is an invitation into abundance for everyone, especially those who have no resources in themselves. It is a chapter of amazing grace. It is a chapter of limitless mercy, and again, abundance, spirit, soul, and body. We're going to read just a portion of this chapter as a springboard into the message, um, but it would, it would behoove you as homework to read the whole chapter. You will be glad that you did. Isaiah 55, we're going to begin at verse 6, where it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. How many of you are glad that our God abundantly pardons? He doesn't, he doesn't just pardon. He, he, he takes our transgressions and he separates them from us as far as the east is from the west. For my thoughts, God says, are not your thoughts. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy, and be led out with peace, and be led out with peace. Hear that, and be led out with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. There are things in this life that you and I will never fully understand. And if you are hell-bent on understanding certain things, if you solely seek to figure them out rather than seeking God, there is absolutely no evidence in Scripture or elsewhere that you ever will understand. And in your pursuit of earthly understanding, you'll miss out on having peace. I mean, there are things that I'll, I'll, you know, earthly things that I'll never fully understand. Things like nuclear physics or microbiology or nanotechnology. I'm never going to understand those things. I'm never even going to try. But if I can't understand earthly things, how do I think I'm ever going to fully figure out the realm of the spirit, the unseen, the things of God? God says, for my thoughts 
are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your thoughts and my thoughts than your thoughts. Listen, astronomers have spotted galaxies 12.3 billion light years away from Earth. To put that distance into perspective, consider the fact that light travels at 186,000 miles per second. And in that, it only takes eight minutes for light to travel the 93 million miles from the sun to the earth. So sunlight is only eight minutes old. But light from the furthest galaxy takes 12.3 billion years to get here. That, that distance is virtually incomprehensible. And God says that is at least the distance between his thoughts and our thoughts. We underestimate the goodness of God and the greatness of God and God's love. Your best thought about God on your best day falls 12.3 billion light years short of how great and how good God actually is. Now, unexpected things are going to happen in our lives. I mean, I mean, who expected a global pandemic in our lifetime? Who, who expected everybody to be wearing masks in America? None of us had even heard the term social distancing a year ago. But on a personal level, there will be unexpected challenges that will arise. Jesus, Jesus didn't say, in this world you might have tribulation. He said, in this world you will have tribulation. So it will not be whether significantly challenging scenarios arise, but how you respond to them when they do. Things you didn't see coming, things that, that, that might blindside you or even sucker punch you from behind. You, you did not plan for them. Never in a million years did you think such a thing would happen, that it would be you, that it would happen to you. They are unexpected. But things that are unexpected to us are not unexpected to God. God never looks at an event in your life and says, oh, snap. But when you have your oh snap or, excuse me, oh crap moment, when, when, when hardship or suffering or trauma or calamity comes knocking on your door, if you solely seek to understand why, if you seek an explanation that you can wrap your head around, if you rack your brain trying to connect the dots, if you solely seek an earthly answer, you will miss out on the bigger picture because you'll bypass the peace of God. You see, earthly answers do not equal peace. The credit report may explain why you didn't get the loan, but it won't bring you peace. You may get your hands on the rap sheet of the criminal who broke into your home or actually see on your ring video system on that camera. You might actually see the thief who stole your car, but it won't bring you peace. Those things can actually get you more stirred up, more fearful, more freaked out. And just because you think you understand something doesn't mean you actually understand something. You know, I, 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 I've had discussions with people where I look at them straight in the eyeballs, talk to them, say, do you understand that? And they say, absolutely, 100%, and go right out of the room and do the very opposite. Know this. There is a difference between having peace and being pacified. Sometimes the danger in seeking to understand is that we're actually seeking to be pacified. You see, peace can handle the truth. Peace can sit with the truth. Peace can sit with reality. It doesn't need to deflect and to justify with lies just to feel better about a given situation. The, listen, the pacifier feeds into that urge to control. In, in other words, that desire to be God and not allow God to be God. Peace is the power to sit with reality and allow God to be God. After three and a half weeks of waiting, Pastor Elena and I received the autopsy report earlier this week. It's detailed, it's graphic. 
It was seven pages from hell. It was horrific to have to read. And it certainly did not bring us peace. But I'm here to tell you, we weren't looking for peace from a report because we already had peace. Because we have another report. We have the report of the Lord. And here's the key. When, when, when you encounter trouble beyond your control, ready, rather than seeking to understand, seek to stand under. Take shelter under the wings of the Almighty. Take shelter under the shadow of El Shaddai. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him will I trust. Listen, He's your refuge. He's your high tower. He's your stronghold and your safe harbor. God is your fortress. He is your habitation. He is your hiding place. The Lord is your haven. He is your safe place. He's your shield and your exceedingly great reward. I'm talking about stepping out of the earthly desire to know all the answers and stepping into the covering of God. So standing under an open heaven where you will be led out with peace. Turn over in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. My family, as you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, as you're turning a handful of pages to the right, please hear me. There's something that I've learned both from the Scriptures and from personal experience. Just as being right with supersedes being right, let me say that again. Just as being right with supersedes being right in the same way. Peace is more important than having all the answers. Peace is certainly more medicinal than making up answers. Peace is far more precious than figuring it all out. Peace is more powerful than trying to make sense of senseless things. Peace surpasses understanding. Because the God kind of peace is not just serenity or tranquility. It's not downloading the Calm app and listening to rainfall for 30 seconds. It's not a temporary respite until the next challenge comes along. It's not just pushing the pause button to get a quiet moment until the ruckus resumes. It, peace is not noise cancellation headphones for the cacophony in your soul. The God kind of peace is shalom. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. The Lord is saying, I'm not giving you temporary solutions to permanent problems. I'm not giving you band-aids for festering wounds. I'm not digging a hole in the sand for you to stick your head into. I'm not giving you quick fixes, shortcuts, avoidance strategies, and exit plans. I'm not prescribing meds to mask your pain and soothe your symptoms without ever dealing with the root issues? No. I'm giving you peace in the storm. I'm giving you peace that is more potent than the storm. Peace that propels you to walk atop storms. I'm giving you shalom. Supernatural stability and soundness. Divine security and favor. A Holy Spirit undergirding, a spiritual buoyancy, a permanent inner poise that is not tethered to, nor can it be shaken by external adversity. Jesus is giving you healing and wholeness that the world cannot give, and therefore the world cannot take it away. The world doesn't have this kind of peace, so it can't give it to you. But he is the God of peace himself. He is the God of shalom. He is the God of nothing missing, nothing broken. Therefore, the Lord has given you nothing missing, nothing broken kind of peace. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7 says this. And let the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. 
the peace of God, the peace that only Jesus gives. The peace, that, that peace, it is the peace that surpasses understanding. It exceeds understanding. It, it, it eclipses understanding. It outperforms understanding. It outpaces, it outweighs, it outranks, it outrivals, it outruns, it outmatches, it outshines, it overshadows, oversteps, and overrides human understanding. Listen, you're searching for understanding when you already have something that's far better. You're seeking an answer when you already have the answer. Know this. There is a peace that transcends what you and I can comprehend. There is a peace that goes beyond the limits of this world. There is a peace that towers above the boundaries of logic and reason. And it is yours. Go back one verse with me to verse 6 in Philippians chapter 4 where it says, Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let your requests be known with, with thanksgiving. In other words, Lord, I don't have it figured out. Everything is a little bit foggy. I, there are times that I am scared. There are times that I am fra afraid. But I thank you that you have not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. L L Lord, during this pandemic, I, I lost my job. I, I, I don't have any income, but I thank you that you are my God and you will supply all of my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Lord, 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 I got the labs back. I got the medical report back and it is not good. It is, it is not good whatsoever. But, but, but I thank you that you are my God, that you are my Lord, that you are my King and that you forgive all my iniquity and heal all my diseases. I thank you. Let me give you a working definition that will also kind of pinpoint how this all works. Anxiety, as you can see here in Philippians chapter 4, anxiety is the opposite of peace. Peace is confident trust in God's wise and good control over your life. Let me say that again. Peace is confident trust in God's wise and good control over your life. It's believing that you don't have the answer, but you do know the one who does. You, you, you may not know what's going on, but you know that Jesus does. See, when you worry, when you fret, when you're anxious, and you're, and you're trying to figure it all out and fix yourself or fix somebody else or, or fix a given situation and control outcomes, you're pretty much telling God that you're not confident in his plan. You're not confident in his ability, in his sovereignty, in his love for you. On the other hand, you, you, you can see people making it through horrific situations and trauma that you don't even want to ever imagine could happen to you, but they're making it through it with grace. They're, they're, they're not coming off the rails. They're, they're doing it without bitterness. They maintain poise the best they can. They, they, they can still somehow manage to put one foot in front of the other. They have peace. How? Their faith is manifesting. Their trust is manifesting. Relying on God, believing God, trusting God, it's the pipeline for peace. Isaiah said it like this, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Peace is accessed by believing and speaking. Shalom shapes you when you cast your care. Peace becomes a practical reality by exercising total reliance, relinquishing the myth of control in total surrender. Peace manifests through faith. 
Ours has sounded something like this. I thank you, Father, that Justin is with you. That we don't have to say goodbye, but we get to say, we'll see you later. We know that Justin confessed you as his Lord, that he believed in you. And so, Lord, that's where our trust is. That he's with you. That, 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 that Pastor Elena's brown sugar is with you. That Trey and Elasia and Gian's big brother is with you. That that, that, that handsome real estate agent, that, that fun gamer who loved everybody and everybody loved him. He is with you. And now, Lord, we know that he is his best him. We know that in this moment, you have restored him to his original design. Lord, we have restoration plus because we know that he is with you. Jesus, you said, you, you said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And those who live and believe in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Lord? Yes, I do. That's when peace like a river can attend your way. There's something you treasure, something you love. It's not in your hands, but is in God's hands, and everything is better in God's hands. And when you get your restoration, plus it may look different, but that love, that cherished thing that's in God's hands, that's in God's care, the Lord will use it to shape you. 2 Kings chapter 4, there's an amazing story where Elisha and his assistant Gehazi um, come across a Shunammite woman. They're going through the region of Shunam. They come across her. She's a wealthy woman. She invites them uh, to her home to have a meal with her. And then every time they come through, she invites them to her home to have a meal. And, and they come. And then one day she goes to her husband and says, you know, this Elisha, this prophet, he's, he's legit. He's a man of God. And so I want us to build out a room on the roof, on the second story on the roof, build out a room, you know, like a, a, a prophet's chamber. And, and I want us to furnish it with everything that he needs. And the husband is more than happy to comply. And they build out this room. And when... Elisha and Gehazi finally get to go to this prophet's chambers, this prophet's quarters that was built just for Elisha. Elisha turns to Gehazi and says, hey, go get the Shunammite woman. And she comes and he says, you know, you've done all this for us. What, what can I do for you? Can I speak to the king on your behalf? Can I speak to the commander of the army on your behalf? And she says, well, you know, we're good. You know, we've got our home. We live Amongst our people, we're, we're, we're good. And she leaves. And Elisha's not satisfied. Turns towards Gehazi and says again, what, what can we do for her? And Gehazi says, well, um, they have no children and her husband is well advanced in years. Elisha says, go get her again. And she comes back and she stands, the Bible says specifically, she stands in the doorway. And I think that's a beautiful and powerful picture. She stands in the doorway. Practically speaking, she's, you know, she's respecting Elisha. She's not walking into the doorway. She stands in the doorway. But, you know, prophetically speaking, she's standing at an open door. God's about to open a door for her that no man, no situation, and no devil in hell could shut. And so Elisha says to her, this time next year you will hold a son in your arms. And she says, no, 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 don't, don't, don't say something like that. Don't, don't get my hopes up. Don't, yeah, don't put your own credibility on the line here. Don't, don't say something like that. Well, a year later, she's holding a son in her arms. And the boy grows, and one day he goes out to his dad, who's out in the field with the reapers. He's out there for a while, and then he cries out to his father, my head, my head. The father gets one of the workers, one of the servants, and says, quick, take him to his mother. And so 
They scoop him up, take him to his mom, place the boy on the woman's lap where he dies. What she does next will speak to us. She takes her boy and she does not place him on his own bed. She doesn't place him on her bed or his father's bed. She takes the boy and climbs the stairs to the prophet's chambers and she lays him on Elisha's bed. And then she goes out into the field and says to her husband, quick, get me a servant and a donkey. I must go see the man of God. And he says, well, it's not a new moon and it's not a a Sabbath. Is everything okay? And do you know what she says? She says, it is well. She goes and when Elisha sees her coming, he says to Gehazi, his assistant, that's the Shunammite woman. Quick, make haste and go ask her. Is it well with you? Is it well with your husband? And is it well with the child? And when he does, she replies a second time, it is well. Her son has died and she says, it is well. By the way, when she says, it is well, do you know that is what? She says it twice. And and anytime something is repeated twice in the Bible, it's for emphasis. She says, it is well twice. Do you know that that is one Hebrew word? You know what she responds each time? She says, shalom. I have shalom. She makes her way to Elisha and she says to Elisha, I told you, don't get my hopes up. And he looks at Gehazi and gives Gehazi his staff and says, you know what? Tuck your shirt into your belt and run as fast as you can to this boy. Do not stop to answer any questions from anybody. And when you get to him, put my staff on his face. And so the Shunammite woman turns to Elisha and says, as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. Gehazi goes ahead of them, and the two of them then make their way behind Gehazi. When Gehazi gets to the house, he puts the staff on the child's face, but nothing happens. He leaves the room, comes back to meet them as they're about to enter the house, and says nothing happened. And so Elisha goes into that room all by himself, just him and the boy, and shuts the door. How many of you know there are times you've got to get with God in the face of your problem and shut the door? the door. And he lays on top of the boy, mouth to his mouth, eyes to his eyes, and hands outstretched to his hands. And he lays there. Suddenly warmth starts to come back into the boy. And so he gets up and he starts to pace around his room, undoubtedly praying, undoubtedly praising. And he gets back on top of the boy, mouth to his mouth and eyes to his eyes and hands to his hands. And the boy sneezes seven times. You know what a sneeze is, right? A sneeze is a 240 mile an hour expulsion of your breath to get rid of something that's in your respiratory system. There was something in this boy that had to go at 240 miles an hour seven times completely, and it was death itself. (laughs) Elisha calls for the mom and presents him back to her. My family, there are things you are trying to figure out that God wants you to faith it out. Listen, every time you begin to worry, find five things you can be thankful for. Every time you start to feel anxious, spend five minutes in prayer. Every time you're tempted to figure out a problem in your flesh, find five promises of God. Because if we insist that everything about God's ways and God's plans have to be made completely intelligible to us before we decide to act on his invitation into trust, we will never have peace. Faith is letting go of superficial securities and certainties. 
and thrusting the whole of your spirit, soul, and body in total reliance into the hands of an almighty Father who always has your best interest at heart and who loves you with an everlasting love. And when you do, something better than answers rises up on the inside of you. Something better than explanation, something better than temporary appeasements and short-lived solutions. You will be led out with peace. That means you'll be led out of chaos and you'll be led out of confusion. You'll be led out of disillusion. You'll be led out of despair and you'll be guided into shalom. You will have the peace of God because you've already got the God of all peace. You have what you don't know.